talk with us a little bit further about this amazing ecosystem. Um, so panelists, I'm going to ask you to introduce yourselves. Uh, tell us a little bit about who you are, what you do, and why you love the Akawaha. Um, we're going to start with, with uh, Brittany. Um, go ahead, Brittany. Hi, everyone. I'm Brittany Bernstein. I am the development manager here at Florida Conservation Voters, and I grew up uh, 10 minutes from the Eureka boat ramp, um, and I just, it's, it's someone somewhere very special um, to me. Awesome. Thanks, Brittany. Um, okay, uh, Cora Bircham, would you introduce yourself, please? Where's, oh, Cora, you're on mute. You're on mute. Oh, <laughs> I was like, I know I saw you here. Where are you? <laughs> Sorry about that. Okay, now I think I'm unmuted. Perfect. Okay, sorry about that. I'm Cora Bircham. I'm the Director of Multimedia and Manatee Research Associate for Save the Manatee Club. And the Oklawaha is really important for us because manatees are currently depending a lot on artificial warm water habitats, such as the outflow of power plants. And it's really unsustainable for them in the future. So they really need those natural warm water sources. So restoring the Oklahoma River would really open up those natural springs for manatees that are really needed in the future as the population is growing. Awesome. Thanks so much, Cora, for being here tonight. Um, Elizabeth Neville, would you like to introduce yourself, please? Oh, there you are. Yes, thank you. Hi, I'm Elizabeth Neville. I am the senior Gulf Coast representative for Defenders of Wildlife. And we are so excited about the potential for this restoration project because by restoring thousands of acres of forest and wetlands, we can provide and restore so much habitat for important species like the Florida panther, Florida black bear, bald eagles, and more. Thanks so much, Elizabeth. All right. Um, we also have with us uh, Karen Chadwick, I believe, although I'm not seeing her on the screen. Oh, there she is. <laughs> Oh, yes, yeah. there you go. <laughs> hey, Karen. Computer, her name there. Perfect. <laughs> Thanks. Hi, I'm Karen Chadwick. I'm a Florida native, and I live uh, close to Kenwood Ramp, I, and I've lived within a few minutes from the Orange Springs and Kenwood Ramp for 30 years, and I've just been watching the system degrade um, continuously over that time, and I run uh, tours for um, North Star Charters on the Oklawaha and um, St. John's River area lakes and rivers. Great, thanks so much, Karen, uh, for being here. Um, so we have, I've got some questions in my mind for sure that I wanna ask our panelists, um, but I would also like to just flag for everybody, if you've got questions about the film um, that you think our panelists can help uh, do a deeper dive on, um, please do use the chat box at the bottom. Um, we, you can either type your question or you can say, hey, I've got a question. Let me get off mute so I can ask it. Um, but let's use the uh, chat box in the bottom uh, for any questions. And yes, Erica, uh, free Akawaha will give us our clean sand bottom river back um, so we can watch our lost fish swim back to Silver Springs. Absolutely, um, 100%. Um, so I'm gonna be monitoring the chat box for questions that come in, um, but let's kick off with uh, Brittany. I, I would love to hear more and I'm, I'm kind of uh, thinking, wow, we've known each other for a couple of years now and I, I'm sort of amazed that I, do, I, haven't, I haven't learned more yet about your experience growing up on the Oklahoma. So can you share a little bit about what, why it's special for you? Yeah, um, so like I said, I grew up 10 minutes from the Eureka boat ramp. We were there almost every weekend uh, with my family. It's a very personal and emotional place for me. It has, I mean, when I when I think back in my childhood and um, my memories of my family, like it's the Akawaha. Uh, and so I don't know who here um, grew up with the, so uh, the fisherman story of when you catch your first bass, you kiss it and you return it so that it tells everyone else, all the other fish that you're a good one and they come to you. <laughs> I caught my first bass on the Akawaha from the stump fields. It was covered in mud. 
Um, I remember I almost fell out of the boat catching it and my dad had to hold the back of me and he told me to kiss it. And I remember my whole face was muddy um, and I returned it. And ever since then, I always outfish my dad. So I think it works. Um, it definitely holds true. But, you know, it's, it's a very community centered place. Um, you you meet people at the boat ramp, you make friends, uh, you share community stories like and, and best fishing practice. Like if you really wanna catch catfish, go when it's raining. Um, you know, there's just things like that about the Akawaha and it's just given me a lifelong appreciation for the water and it's what has, it, I probably didn't know this when I was little, but it has been a huge driving factor and why I do what I do and why I work for Florida conservation voters and why it's so important that we protect our land and water. And I mean, it didn't matter if you didn't catch a single thing on the river that day, it was always a good day on the Okawaha. Absolutely, a bad day. What, what is it? A bad day fishing is better than a good day at work. Yes. <laughs> I've seen that bumper dad, sticker. Like, yeah, I think my dad like still calls me and it's like, you're only two and a half hours away. Do you really want to work today? We can go fishing. Just come on down. <laughs> Thanks, Brittany. Um, so Karen, I know you, I'm sure, have some similar experiences. You have a really deep connection to the Riverway. Um, share with us, if you would, how long have you been living and working along the Oklawaha? I know you mentioned it in the film, um, and, and maybe talk a little bit about how you've seen the river change over time. All right, I've been watching it for um, 30 years, and uh, going out on the, you know, Silver River, Oklawaha, and St. John's, and um, something that it just repeats over and over, and, and I talked about it in the film, is the aquatic vegetation blockages. And it, it's really, it's Rodman Reservoir is an unreliable recreational resource. You never know when you go out there if the, the ramps are going to be blocked, if the river channel is going to be blocked. You just never know. And they, they use a lot of herbicides. Tens of thousands of dollars um, of chemicals are sprayed um, on the waterways in Rodman over and over and over. Um, Diquat, uh, 2,4-D, glyphosate, um, this whole, there's a whole um, cocktail of chemicals that are sprayed in the waterway over and over and over. And those plants die and they fall to the bottom and it's just, it's um, developing a, just a thick mucky layer on the bottom, which the, you know, the fish can't bed in that. So that's, um, with a restored river, you'd use a lot less chemicals. There'd be a lot less spraying, the water would be moving. Eureka ramp, I've never seen it blocked. The water's moving there and the plants just don't have a chance to, to build up and block the, the boat ramp. Great. So it's, a, you know, it's environmental and it's an economic problem. Yeah, yeah, I was gonna say, I appreciate you highlighting um, just the maintenance costs. Sorry, while I fiddle with my light here, uh, the maintenance costs um, in, in so many ways, when we sort of mess with mother nature's natural cycles, we add additional burdens on ourselves. Mother nature does so many things for free um, and so much better than we can. So I appreciate you, you highlighting that point. Um, let's see, Cora, um, you, where are you? There you are. Um, I know you work with a species that is really near and dear to not just so many Floridians hearts, but people all over the world um, love manatees. Um, what effect has the loss of habitat associated with damming the Great Florida Riverway had on manatee populations specifically? Yeah, so we, we do have an increasing manatee population, especially in the upper St. John's River. Most of them currently winter at Blue Spring State Park. Um, hundreds, you've probably seen the footage in the documentary. Um, there were quite a few. Um, unfortunately, a lot of manatees right now depend on these artificial warm water sites, which are really these outflow of power plants. If you're looking down Brevard County, for example, um, hundreds of manatees migrate to these artificial warm water sites from power plants and those are unsustainable for the future because they're going to go offline at some point so um, there has to be a way for those manatees to actually use those natural warm water sources and if we were going to restore the um the Oklahoma river 
mantis would actually be able to freely migrate between the St. John's River and the Oklawaha and the Silver River and then migrate to Silver Spring, as well as using some of the, uh, the springs that are currently um, inaccessible to them because they're basically completely drowned out, like you've seen in the documentary. Um, there's already a few manatees that are using the system. However, it's not safe for them to get through the Buckman Lock. Um, it's a really big issue for them. So although we are already seeing some, there could literally be dozens, if not hundreds more manatees that could use that system. We do have um, one uh, example I wanted to mention here is actually a manatee named Millie. She's a very large individual. She is actually in our Save the Manatee adoption program, so um, you can adopt her as well. But uh -huh. she um, she was uh, known in Brevard County. She was a Brevard animal that used um, all the Atlantic coast up and down. She's a Blue Spring animal, and recently she's also really been seen in the Silver River and the Oklahoma River, which is really cool. So we do see that manatees migrate back and forth, and we really need to open up that system so more manatees can safely do so. That's great. Um, and I know Carson's going to be dropping some of the links as as our panelists sort of mentioned things like Millie, the manatee. Um, Carson will be dropping some links in the chat so y'all can monitor there. Um, and I would we'll probably do a maybe a follow up email to everybody. That way, if you miss something in the chat, you don't have to stress about it. Um, we'll make sure that we capture all of the action links um, so that you can just uh, be here in the moment with us. Um, before, I, I, I definitely want to get to you, Elizabeth. Um, I also want to um, sort of honor some of the comments in the chat. Um, Captain Karen, um, you've got a question about the amazing shirt that you were wearing in the documentary, uh, the steamboat breaking down the dam. So if you care to share uh, a link or any insights on that shirt, it sounds like there's some interest there. <laughs> Um, um, I believe Florida Defenders of the Environment has some of those printed. I'm not sure how many are left. It, it was an old design that was reprinted. And uh -huh. um, so we'd have to check and see if there's any available. Okay, excellent, excellent. Um, let's see, we also have, um, Leslie, I'm gonna get to your question as soon as I let uh, Elizabeth have a little bit of floor time here. Um, uh, uh, Leslie has a really great question um, for I think all the panelists about opposition. Uh, to freeing the Oklawaha. But before we go there, um, let's hear from Elizabeth. Um, I'm really curious to hear what you think, Elizabeth, about um, you know, what kind of wildlife um, benefits can we see with restoration of thousands of acres of forest and floodplain when the Oklawaha is finally set free? Thank you, Aliki. That's a really good question. Well, as you saw in the documentary now, about 15,000 acres of forest and wetlands will be restored. That's about 7,500 that were destroyed by the crusher crawler when the dam was put in place, as well as an additional 8,000 acres that are stressed by the artificial water levels from the dam. So forested wetlands are really important to so many different types of species and some broad levels of um, avian species. <coughs> birds, of course, will really benefit from having enhanced tree habitat bald eagles, wild turkeys, um, wood ducks, songbirds will all benefit from enhanced habitat and terrestrial species. This is really important. Um, wildlife corridors are tremendously important to species like the Florida panther and Florida black bear that require large swaths of un un uninterrupted, excuse me, habitat to survive and thrive. So, um, Male Florida panthers, for example, they average 200 square miles of territory that they need to use and females use about 70 and vehicle collisions are the greatest source of mortality for Florida panthers. So it's really important that they have space to roam and that they're able to move to obtain the things that they need to survive and thrive. And especially as Florida's human population increases, you know, resulting in development and roads, it's really important for the panther to be able to expand its habitat northward um, you know, to, can, to recover. So um, wildlife corridors, which are these uninterrupted swaths of habitat are so important. And um, the wetlands that'll be part of the Okawaha restoration are part of the Ocala to Osceola wildlife corridor, which is a big part of the Florida wildlife corridor which stretches throughout the state. Great, yeah, Dr. Um, who was it on the documentary? Um, Somebody was talking about the, I'm, I'm totally blanking, but um, there's so many corridor opportunities that remain in Florida. And I would be remiss if I didn't 
you know, highlight that Florida actually has some pretty stellar conservation programs like Florida Forever that would enable us to protect some of those last remaining um, corridors that you're talking about, Elizabeth. Um, so thanks for thanks for highlighting that. Um, let's um. So Leslie's got a question, and I think yes, Tom Hochter. Thanks, Jim. Tom Hochter, Dr. Hochter was the one talking about corridors in the film. Um, he, he's definitely in my mind the corridor man. <laughs> um, question from Leslie, which I think is a really good one. Let me scroll back and make sure I found it. Um, so I don't, I don't want to get it wrong. Um, Leslie's curious about um, what is some of the opposition to removing the dam. You know, uh, what are some of the things that people are saying or um, pushing back on? with this idea of freeing the Akwawaha. Um, Karen, Cora, uh, Elizabeth, perfect. Okay, thanks doctor, thank you. The, the, um, the fishing clubs, they, there are clubs that come to Kenwood and, and have their little tournaments. They, they just use Rodman like a lake. And so it's on the circuit. And when, um, when Kenwood is blocked up uh, by aquatic vegetation and, or gets sprayed and it's just like dead, mucky stinky nasty dead plants they don't want to use the anglers don't like it they don't like the herbicide applications so they just switch to the riverfront it's just on the circuit um mm -hmm. like orange lake uh lock Lusa, you know other lakes in the area mm -hmm. and so they you know the bass fishing clubs they they utilize it for that when they can when it's available um there's also people that that live um mostly on the Marion County side that with the water up, they have waterfront property. With the restored river, um, a lot of those people won't have waterfront property anymore. Mm -hmm. And so that, you know, that needs to be taken into consideration, but, but it, you know, the state plan is to restore the hydrology of the Okawaha River. We support what the state, what the state plan is for the health of the whole system. You know, we don't oppose that. So, right. and, uh, you know, a lot of it is the aquatic vegetation that's building up this muck and it's cre creating a um, eutrophication on the bottom. Yeah. Yeah. I, um, I really appreciate that. Um, and I know in the documentary, one of the things that stood out to me was that some of the, some of the arguments for the dam um, are sort of maybe crumbling with, with time. Um, I don't know, Elizabeth, if you can um, elaborate a little bit on, on these issues. Sure, absolutely. And Karen, thank you for teeing up that really important local perspective. Now, another part of this too is that this really, I think this is really emphasized by the documentary that this isn't just an issue. You know, I feel like so much of the focus has been on the dam historically, but really this is a potential project with a regional, broad reaching benefit um, for this incredibly interconnected river system. Um, yes, historically the opposition has been, you know, groups of bass anglers, but as we saw in the film, that's really not representative of all anglers. And I know the Free the Akawaha Coalition has um, facilitated some really effective stakeholder outreach. Um, we've been working with anglers to learn what's important to them. And there have been some recreational amenities proposed, particularly by the University of Florida Student Showcase. And there's some really interesting concepts that are generating some excitement. So I think, um, you know, that's some of the opposition. But I do think there is a shift as people are understanding more and more how important water quality is the benefits to, um, to water quality that this will bring, as well as just the tremendous potential from this restoration project. Yeah, great. Can I add to that? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. A little bit. Yeah, I just wanted to go back to the areas I was talking about, um, wherever the most, there's a couple of parcels that are still private, but most of where the water touches the shoreline, that's all greenway property, uh, averaging about 300 feet from the water up upland and um so that's all state park property so it isn't a putnam or marion county issue it's a state park all florida residents that are paying taxes you know property taxes are paying for this state park so we're everybody in florida is a is a stakeholder mm -hmm. and there's a lot of um, um misinformation that's being shared um like the potable water idea it's not a good source for that mm -hmm. and um I was at a meeting one time, I'll just keep this real brief, meeting one time and somebody asked um, a member of the Chamber of Commerce in Putnam County, what are you selling at, with regards to Rodman, like um, nationwide or locally, you know, what are you selling? And she said, it's more the idea of what it is, not what it actually is. Hmm. 
Interesting. Yeah, it's dangerous when facts aren't the things that we use to direct um, public policy decisions. <laughs> um, Elizabeth, I don't know, I know you, you may want to uh, close us out on this. And then I have another question for you, um, Captain um, Chadwick, which I think kind of is related to all this. But um, Elizabeth, did you want to add something here? Yes, just one more quick thing. And I think it just kind of goes to, you know, this dam has been in place for 50 years. And I think for a lot of folks, the status, it's the status quo. You know, I know that we spoke with a lot of people in the film that have known it differently how it was before. And I think that that memory is, um, you know, not always understood. So anytime you're trying to change the status quo, I think you come up against resistance. But I think there is growing understanding of just the really tremendous opportunity at hand here. And there's so much to be excited about. Mm -hmm. So um, yeah, yeah. That's just the big thing is just changing the status quo is always hard, but it's been really exciting to, um, you know, really learn of the tremendous support there is for this project. Yeah. Well, and speaking of the excitement, I'm, I'm really curious, um, you know, Karen, you, you get visitors, I'm sure, from all over the country, all over the state, all over the country, probably all over the world um, when they're coming for vacation. Um, and obviously, you know, they're spending their, they're, they're spending their dollars to spend time in these amazing um, places. What, what do they get excited about? What, do, what are your, what do you see that your customers and guests um, get excited about? Well, my customers, my passengers, um, they want to see the wildlife and they want to see the springs, mm -hmm. which when the water's up, like it is right now, because of the dam, you, you hardly see any wildlife at all. Hardly see any birds, no alligators, turtles, um, all the way from Eureka to the dam, it's 16 miles. You can go all along there when the water's up and hardly see any wildlife at all. During the drawdown, you see so much more wildlife. Um, when when there's a drawdown, I am so booked. Um, it's it's mind-boggling trying to keep up with everybody. I don't have anybody now that wants to go. Oh, let's go out of Kenwood uh, and just look at a big blank lake, you know. And the and the the fishermen, the anglers, they're not fishing out in the middle. If you go out there and look, they're not. They go. They're treating that whole area like a big river system. They go right to the shorelines. They want to fish by the pads. They're not fishing out in the middle of the stump field that you just don't see anybody out there. And yeah. if I can just give a quick plug to this, akuahariver.com, mm -hmm. there's a map, akuahariver.com, there's a map on there. You can go there and you'll see like a satellite map. Click on that and zoom in and you'll see a lot of different points. There were 96 steamboat landings from Palaka to Silver Springs during the steamboat era. There's so much history along there and it's just, it's just lost um, during the drawdown. We can go the whole way and we can talk about um, Payne's Landing and Fort Brook and uh, you know the Native American sites. And it's fascinating. And, and then when the water comes back up, boop, it's over. Mm -hmm. You said akawaha.com? Akawaharriver.com. Akawaharriver.com. Mm -hmm. OK, perfect. Thank you. Um, Helen makes a comment in here, and I think it ties really well, um, Karen, with what you just uh, shared. You, Helen's expressing the importance um, of explaining how important wildlife is to our environment. Um, it's not, this isn't, you know, we're, the, the effort here is um, to create habitats and to allow for habitats that are good for wildlife, but there are so many important things that wildlife do and, and you just sort of touched on it um karen that's what people that's what people gravitate to like that's where people feel um connection to nature and that's where people get supercharged and want to do something and get active um, it's because they get to experience um what it's like to be on a thriving river system with with that's teeming with wildlife not just a big old you know kind of stagnant pond. <laughs> nobody wants, nobody wants that. Um, so, so while we're talking on the subject uh, a little bit here of, of um, direct experiences and, and community connections, I know um, Brittany, like Karen, and as you described earlier, the Akawaha really has a deep connection for you. Um, what are some things, let's kind of maybe take a little trip into the past um, a little bit. What are some things you remember uh, about living on the river that stick with you today? 
Yeah, I listening to Karen talk is like going home for me. So mm -hmm. I'm just really grateful to be on this panel with her. Uh, but yeah, I remember the the river and the boat ramp was just like such a place of community. So it didn't matter if you just met this person and if they were having trouble, you help them. And, you know, if they brought their saltwater tackle box, you traded and like, you know, gave them a good day on the river. I remember when the boat ramp was dirt and now there's a dock where people can actually bank fish safely. Um, so it's changed a lot. And when you pass someone on the river, you always stopped and was like, oh, how was your day? How's the weather? Uh, did you catch anything? Where are they biting? And, you know, where, where are the turtles and the alligators sunning? Because that's what people want to see. It doesn't matter. I've lived in Florida my entire life, born and raised here. I always want to see a turtle sunning. So if you <laughs> tell me where one is, I, I want to go see it. Um, you know, and I'm in my 30s, so imagine how exciting that is for a kid. Uh, but it was also, you know, Karen mentioned how the when the water comes up, it changes. So it was also passing on that knowledge of, oh, hey, watch out, there's a stump you can't see, or a tree limb down because you can't see it because of the water's up. Um, so passing on that knowledge, and then, you know, when the water rises, the bends are familiar, but the landscape is like looking at a familiar stranger. It's just, it's not the same. It, it, when the water's down inside the bank lines, like it's heaven on earth, but yeah, it's, I don't know. I could, I could go on forever um, <laughs> about this. And then I, yeah, sorry. Well, I, this is a call for everyone to get out there who hasn't been out there for sure. <laughs> Like, yes. Find a time on your calendar. Uh, get 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 out. <laughs> and like the video said, there's so many things to do on the Aqua Aquaha. I know I'm talking a lot about fishing, but you can paddle it. You can swim it. You can take a glass bottom rope ride at Silver Springs. Like there's so many things to do that it doesn't really matter what your thing is. There's something for you on that river. Mm -hmm. Or the whole all three rivers. Yeah. Can I jump back in there for just sure. a minute? Yeah, yeah, go ahead. Okay. Well, I want to mention, um, we're talking about tourism a lot, but mm -hmm. um, during the drawdowns, the guides are slammed too. Like if you go to uh, Kenwood Ramp during the drawdown, you, we do um, sunrise tours sometimes. And um, we'll be right next to the fishing guides. Erica Ritter is on here. She's um, She grew up along the river too. Um, Brittany, I don't know if you might know her, her family. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but the point is that all the guides are there, the fishing guides, they are slammed. They're, there's fishing in the river. You know, when the river is within its banks, the tour guides are out. We go out at the same time. We're all hanging out. Everybody's drinking coffee, you know, just waiting for the sun to come up and the passengers to hurry up and get there. And um, so there's, that's part of the reason why visitation is so much higher. Now, when the water comes back up, you know, our visitors, they don't want, there's nothing for them to see. So we're not going out there, but it's not like you lose fishing. There's still a lot of fishing. There's more people there fishing than when the water is up. Excellent. Um, well, so one, <laughs> what's that? <laughs> Brittany's nodding here. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The fish are always there. You just have to find them. Where you go yeah. to find them changes. Yeah. Well, so one, one animal that I'm really curious about, um, I want to circle back to you, Cora, because I'm wondering, you know, are manatees always there? Um, can you tell us a little bit, of, a little bit more about how, um, you know, freeing the Akawaha, making these connections, or restoring these connections, really? Um, tell me, tell us a little bit more about manatees and how they would benefit. Yeah, absolutely. So right now we do see a lot of manatees that are using the St. John's River really year round. But then in the winter time, um, manatees, you know, they, they look like these big blubbery animals, but they really only have maybe like an inch of fat layer. So they really need that warm water in the winter time, like those warm springs. So freeing the Oklahoma, we, we might see manatees really year round because in the summertime or, you know, throughout the year, we would see them using it sort of as a traveling corridor or as, you know, summer habitat to forage or um, to mate in the summertime, those kind of things. And then in the winter time, um, you know, we may be seeing them using those warm water springs to rest and conserve energy. And instead of having to 
all come to Blue Spring, you know, which is great. We're happy to see them there, but it would be really nice if they had some other options sort of to go to than just this this one um, this one big spring, which the population has really been growing um, in that upper St. John's River. That that part of the population overall is is doing really well, especially if we're looking at other parts of the state right now. I mean, I think most of us know mantis are all over the news right now, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. um, and that that populated subpopulation, the Upper St. John's River, is actually doing really well. So opening up additional habitat for them, you know, could only benefit that whole population. And not having that that dam there, where they sort of have to wait um, for the lock to open and to go through and then come back out, um, they can just freely come and go. That would really be, you know, a, a great addition um, to, to the habitat that they have right now. So, I mean, we do see, um, I do know, we, we already see manatees there. Um, they have been increasing, but currently it's not safe for them to get through the lock. And we could be seeing a lot more than we're currently seeing there right now. So, and I think, I mean, the manatee is a very a charismatic animal. I do know, you know, a lot of people come to Florida to see the manatee. A lot of people, you know, Floridians love to see them. So mm -hmm. if, for example, like in the documentary, it was pointed out Silver Spring could become the next sort of winter hotspot for people to see manatees. Again, you know, creating revenue for not just the park service, but also for the surrounding um, hotels, uh, restaurants, all those kind of things. So I think um, having manatees in all these different areas and having tourism out there because of the manatees and not saying that they're just coming for the manatees. I'm pretty sure they're coming, you know, for all other kinds of things too. But I do think the manatees are, you know, a major draw and would probably be a huge impact for that area too. Yeah, they're, I mean, man, there's no denying manatees are an incredible, they're an incredible draw. They're amazing. I see Leslie's comment in the chat. I, like you, Leslie, was shocked just to hear now that they only have an inch of fat. <laughs> like, I didn't realize that. I mean, it makes total sense. That's why they need the warm waters. But, um, you know, you learn something new every day. And manatees <laughs> are an example of just, you know, an animal. I grew up in Florida. And the fact that I'm just now learning a new thing about manatees is kind of blowing my mind a little bit. So, um, Thanks for thanks for sharing. And it's it's also a, you raise a really good point, um, Cora, about um, really having, you know, what's happening statewide with manatees is devastating. And so making sure that when we have opportunities to expand the places where they can be, we have to take those opportunities. Like they're not, we just we just can't we just can't um, overlook them. Um, I know Erica, I think you may have your hand up. Do you want to jump off mute and ask a question here? Um, I guess I was more on a comment and I wanted to sure um, join in with Brittany that the, the river to me has always been about fishing. <laughs> so, mm -hmm. I mean, I grew up to fish on that river. Um, I, I just, you know, I had uh, my first uh, birthday gift. I needed a fishing pole, you know, I I got a cane pole and smacked my mom right into the river. <laughs> so, I thought I was going to have a short fishing career, but uh, they just laughed too hard at my mom. And um, I also, um, I, you know, I've had so many years plus so many generations of my family on this river. Uh, after 50 plus years, people have forgotten the fish that used to be here and they just don't have any idea what Rodman blocks off. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, my 16th birthday, I said, please take me on the river. That's what I want for my 16th birthday. So I can see the last of the big catfish swimming on the clean sand bottom, monster catfish, uh, schools of largemouth bass, big schools of largemouth bass moving up and down. So I just, I just wanted to share that we've, we've lost more fishing people than we've gained with the Rodman. I mean, they made it famous. They stocked it. They advertised it. They pushed it. Um, so, I mean, it, to me, restoring the river, it's all about all the fish, not just a few species. And I mean, to get uh, the fact that I had to see people coming in with boatloads when I was like 10 or 12 years old to know there were striped bass in the river. Mm -hmm. And then to find out, you know, now we got a hatchery raise them and we don't even get to catch them in the aqua. We got to go somewhere else. Yeah. So um, that's just going to be something. I don't know if you've ever hooked the uh, striped bass, Brittany, but hang on. <laughs> I have not. I yeah. have not. Well, if you ever go over to uh, Salt Springs or around Silver Glen or out to 
there, get your dad to take you and try to catch some of the striped bass. They've, um, the hatchery ones aren't as big as they used to be, but um, you, striped bass are way bigger than uh, the large mouth and you're gonna need 20, 30 pound test and a light set drag or they're gonna take you down the river. <laughs> yeah. Erica, you're making it, me homesick. <laughs> I know. Well, Erica, I mean, uh, first off, you know, that's a, a thank you because that your perspective is so incredibly important in this, in this day and age of 24 hour news cycle, social media. It's so, it is, it's even easier than ever before for people to forget. And so you providing that, that historical perspective, that, that, that community memory about like what these rivers really can be um, is so incredibly important. I, the other thing that your comments sort of highlighted for me um, is this idea that, um, you know, not to go back to the, the question around, you know, who's opposing freeing the Akawaha, but I would imagine that, that folks, um, and, and Elizabeth, maybe you've seen this in, in the work that you've been doing with the coalition, but there's probably a lot of common ground on both sides of the Free the Akawaha and, you know, some of the, some of the other interests um, who may be right now opposing. Elizabeth, I don't know if you want to chime in on that. Absolutely. Well, um, that is something I've observed is that on the whole, I think that the people that are on both sides of this issue, and I think that there's, you know, again, I think conversations are changing. I like to think perspectives are changing. Um, we really have more in common than we have different. Um, every once in a while, I don't really, I'm not a big Facebook user, but I'll go on, you know, different fishing pages and things and people post pictures of manatees and bald eagles and the species that we're working so hard to conserve. And it's clear we all care deeply about them. We're just operating from different perspectives. Um, like the manatees that Chorus was speaking so beautifully to earlier. Um, you know, we do have some manatee use of the system. They do have to lock in and out. And the use of the system is a really good indicator that they will know to use it, you know, once the river is restored. So anyway, I think it's just, you know, focusing on what we have in common, which is so much and um, really seeing how we can work together for the betterment of this whole system. Well, and you know, speaking of things we have in common, there's a there's a qu there's quite a significant coalition um, that has come together. Many many people from many walks of life um, coming together on the free the Akawaha Coalition. Um, can you share some updates on you know what what's the coalition? pushing for. I definitely want to make sure in these last, last 10 minutes or so uh, that we, we um, talk about some things that people can do um, to take action and to get involved. So um, maybe Elizabeth, you can kick us off, but then any, any panelists can jump in here on this, on this piece. Yes, absolutely. Thank you, Aliki. So I'm the co-chair of, you know, I do, I work on some of the advocacy efforts with the coalition and um, we had an exciting update earlier in the season, which is that we delivered 22,000 letters in support of restoring the Great Florida Riverway to Governor DeSantis. Um, it's just clear to so many people all over the state um, and especially in Northeast Florida that there's just so much to gain. It's a win for the economy, a win for wildlife, a win for water, just things we all care about. So that's been really exciting. And so we're at a key point and um, for the folks on the call, if you have time, it would be great if you could please call Governor DeSantis to ask him to please restore the Great Florida Riverway. I can pop the number in the chat or just read it off. Um, it's 850-717-9337. And just call the office politely, you know, let them know that uh, you care about this issue. You would like him to restore the Great Florida Riverway because Right now, it's really um, up to him to direct the agencies to begin undertaking the restoration. And then if you have time after, my organization, Defenders of Wildlife, has a petition going in response to the ongoing manatee mortality event. Um, and it's to ask the US Fish and Wildlife Service to please address some of the underlying causes of this, which is of course, water pollution and restoring habitat like the Great Florida Riverway. So those are two, two things you can do, but definitely call the governor front and center please, um, you know, do that if you have time. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and Carson, I think just dropped uh, the link to that um, um, petition to the United States uh, Fish and Wildlife Service in the chat, as well as the phone number for Governor DeSantis. Um, as we, you know, spend these last nine minutes together, um, Cora, any, any highlights uh, that you want to raise up for folks on ways they can get involved, um, 
with free the aquaha helping save manatees all that good stuff <laughs> yeah absolutely so like i said before um if they do want to help manatees and specifically support the oklawaha um adopting millie this is one of our adoptable manatees that uses the oklawaha system is a really great idea so that's uh one thing also, I serve on the communications committee for the Free the Oklawaha Coalition, and we have a really nice um, social media presence. We are on Instagram, we are on Facebook, on YouTube. So if you're into the social media uh, world, um, you can certainly follow us there. We do post um, a lot of different updates, you know, little videos, things that you can share. Um, this is a really uh, a good thing to follow. We do also currently showcase um, all kind of different perspectives. Uh, we call it the voices for the river. So we do show the student showcases, like someone, I think um, Liz may have mentioned it before. Um, there are some really great projects from UF that have actually explored options of what it would look like if the river was restored. So for some folks who you know, can't quite really see like, okay, so you're, you're talking about restoring. So what, what exactly does that look like? Um, there's some really nice projects and short videos and we do post them on our social media and our website. So um, you can follow that and definitely share the information. Maybe some of you, you know, have a big following or you're considered like social influencers, quote unquote. So um, sharing that and, and giving the topic a larger um, audience is really a, a great thing to do as well. So I would definitely encourage you to do that. Excellent. Great. Thank you so much. Um, Karen, yeah. What would you like to add here? Uh, I wanted to mention if anybody could write an editorial to their mm -hmm. local papers um, talking about this situation, the, the Great Florida Riverway project and um, talk about freeing the Akawaha. There's so much information on these websites, um, freetheakawaha.com and the great Florida riverway.com. Um, there's some action alerts on there and there's so much information. If you need a little help, you know, figuring out what to write for an editorial, you can get a lot of information there. Also, there's um, an event April 17th in Palatka on the riverfront. It's the, um, the Bartram Frolic and I'll be doing boat tours there and the um, Great Florida Riverway will have a, a table. And I think the Riverkeeper, St. John's Riverkeeper is gonna have a table. And um, if you're in the area, come out and um, check that out and help promote that. Is it the St. John's Bartram Frolic? Is that the name of the Bartram Trail Society? Right, on uh, April 17th. Perfect, um, I'm gonna drop, I just, I just, as you were talking, I was like, let me get a link for folks. Um, here's a Facebook event uh, link uh, if folks would like to get a little bit more detail on that. Okay, thanks. Yeah, great. All right, well, um, we've got just a few more minutes. I, I wanna make sure, let me quickly, and I love your suggestion, by the way, um, Karen, I think writing, like keeping these issues alive in the public narrative and the public conversation through letters to the editor and op-eds are so incredibly important. We gotta, keep beating the beating the same drum. Um, I let's see. So want to thank everybody for joining us. Brittany, did you want to add something? Sorry, yeah, I'm I, trying to manage lots of little squares. Am yeah, I you're getting anything? <laughs> you're fine. Um, I was going to say, in addition to the letter to the editor, um, if you have a story about the Akwaha or the Great Florida Riverway that you would like to share with us. Um, Carson dropped a link in the chat where you can write that story and um, we can put it on our blog or our social media site. So we just love to have um, community stories and community ties. Yeah, absolutely. It makes it real for people. It makes it real, it makes it relatable. When they can see themselves in these stories, they 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 stand up and they get active. So um, thanks for sharing that, Brittany, 100%. Um, well, want to thank everybody uh, for joining us. So grateful to our panelists, um, Karen, Cora, Elizabeth, Brittany, um, so many of the other leaders who joined us for the call. Um, Jim, uh, who was here earlier, Erica, thanks so much for your perspectives. Um, really, really appreciate you all here. Um, we invite you, as, as Brittany said, to share your story. That's the most recent link um, that you see in the chat. Um, also in the chat, there is a link to sign up. Uh, make sure that you're getting updates from the Free the Aklawaha Coalition. Um, a lot of things are happening, things are changing, things are moving. Uh, so you're definitely gonna wanna sign up for those uh, updates. Thanks Carson for, for dropping the link there. 
if you want to learn more, um, also don't forget to attend the event um, that, that Captain Karen mentioned. Uh, there's also Defenders of Wildlife. Uh, you're, you all are having an Earth Day event coming up, I believe. And I think Carson's going to drop that link. But you want to uh, tell us about that? Yes, absolutely. So on Earth Day at um, 1215, we're having one of our Lunch and Learn programs. And it is going to talk about um, the importance of restoring the Great Florida Riverway and share some fun wildlife facts. So I hope you can all join. Awesome. Thanks. Lots going on. Well, thank you all. Thanks for spending a Saturday evening with us. I really enjoyed it. I learned a lot. Um, and I really appreciate everything that you do to protect Florida's waters, Florida's wildlife, Florida's amazing riverways like the Great Florida Riverway. Uh, so good night to everyone. Enjoy the rest of your weekend. And I'm sorry I'm in the dark here. <laughs> <laughs> I love